Hey y'all, and welcome back to Coding with Minmer. On today's agenda, we're going to tackle LECO problem 2265, count nodes equal to the average of subtree. Okay, that title is actually the best LECO title I've read yet. We don't even really need to read the whole description. But if you didn't fully get it from just the title, that's fair. Let me show you with LECO's example. Take node 4. We want to see if node 4 equals the average of its entire subtree. And if you remember your middle school math, the average is just the sum over the number of nodes. So what's the sum? All these nodes add up to 24. What about the number of nodes? That's clearly the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. 24 over 6 is 4, and what do you know? That equals node 4. So we can count one node as a part of our answer. We replicate this check with all the other nodes and see how many more satisfy this requirement. And that's what we would return as our answer. In this tree, we have five nodes that equal their subtrees. So therefore, we return five, that's our answer. Okay, so that's the gist of the problem. But let's be a bit closer to the code, figure out which algorithm to use, as well as techniques and pertaining logic. To do this, let's take a look at our binary tree here. The first thing we notice is that it's not a binary tree. Although it's very binary tree looking, all these are probably love children, this is in fact a linked list, which I suppose is a type of tree. Perhaps a skewed one, but whatever, for now we'll treat it like a linked list data structure. Anyway, as to how we actually solve this, the solution that may immediately pop in your head and the one that did in mine is to use a two-pointer approach. We can initialize a first pointer, f for first, to the root node, and a second one as well to also the root node. We'll move this second pointer throughout our entire data structure and on each node that the second pointer is on, add the node's value to a sum, as well as track the number of nodes seen. And of course, the second pointer stops when we get to a null. Pretty simple. And altogether, doing the quick math, we would get 34 divided by 5 for the 5 nodes to get 6.8. How did I know that? But according to the problem statement that I should have read out loud, we're instructed to perform integer division, meaning we can drop decimals and rightfully get a whole integer of 6. That, however, is not equal to our 1 here, so there's nothing to count. After this, to progress our algo, we move the first pointer along and repeat everything all over again, this time with node 8. I'll tell you right now, adding these four numbers would get us 33 divided by the four nodes to get eight. This matches the current node that we're on, so we'll probably count some integer variable to denote that. And let's stop right here. This algorithm works very well, but it's clearly very slow. We're having to visit every single node, but for each of these nodes, we have to visit it and all the nodes beneath it, the subtree in other words. This will yield an n square time complexity. And if this doesn't make sense, just think of this whole thing as a nested for loop, where f is i and s is j. Okay, what's a better solution? Well, if you were smarty pants, you'd tell me that instead of working from top down, you'd tell me to work from bottom up. That instead of a nested for loop both going down, you'd still go down one time, technically. But then on the backtrack, we do our clever math to compute our answer. As to how we make this possible, we can make use of recursion, the recursion forward and the backtrack back. In other words, we'd aggressively recurse all the way to the bottom, and then only on the way back up do we have the bulk of our logic. Giving this a try, yes, we relentlessly recurse forward, only stopping because we got to a null just like before, and backtracking to our 8 here, where on node 8, we know for a fact that we have a sum of 0 so far and 0 nodes. Remember, null doesn't count for anything. We return to this stack frame, where we know that node 8 is the only node there is so far. Therefore, modifying our sum, we now have 0 plus 8, which is 8, and we know that we have the 1 node. So what's 8 divided by 1? That's 8, and that equals node 8 exactly. How many times can I say 8? We can increment some sort of count variable, c for count, to 1 from 0. Continuing this, we can backtrack to node 7, 
and we knew there was beneath it a sum of eight, as well as the count of one node, depicted right here. If we want to calculate the average subtree from here, then we need to extend the sum by adding seven to the eight to get 15, and then increment the number of nodes by one to capture these two nodes. Now, if we do 15 divided by two, what do we get? We get seven. Technically 7.5, but we drop the decimal. This is equal to the current node. We can increment our count variable from one to two. On the backtrack, yep, we can return these two pieces of information. The sum of 15 from these two added together and the number of nodes as well from again, these two nodes. If we want to include node 10, we can add it to our 15 here to get 25. And of course, we'll increment the number of nodes as well. 25 divided by three is eight, which is not 10. We can leave our count integer alone. It's pretty straightforward from here. We backtrack returning both the 25 and three. We wanna calculate the average subtree from node eight. So we include eight in our chain here to get 33 increment our number of nodes to four, do some quick math, 33 divided by four is indeed eight. That matches our node value, we increment count to three. Backtrack some more, and like we saw, 34 divided by five is not one, it's 6.8, but really it's six. Three is our answer, that's what we return. The time complexity has been improved to big O n. The space complexity is also big O n because of the stack frames that we'd accrue. In this example, we'd have exactly n, or 5, stack frames. All right, it's a bit silly that we've been working with a linked list all this time. We can technically be given nodes that have two children, thus forming the essence of a binary tree. The algo remains the same, so let's go over a quick example. Here is our binary tree, finally. We have nodes 27, 420, and negative 10. Now, if you did your due diligence and read the constraints of the leak or problem, you'll note that there cannot be negative values. Therefore, let's just turn this into a positive 10. Sure, why not? Now, building off for the intuition from our previous linked list, we do not want to work from top down, but rather from bottom up, or to be more official, post-order traversal. Let's do it. We start at the root node, where we'll recurse to the left child. At node 420, we do the same exact thing, where we hit a null. Because it's a base case, we'll backtrack and return a sum of zero and a count of zero. Remember, null nodes don't count for anything. Back at node 420, we'll visit its right subtree where it's also null, so we return the same all zero and zero. And if this is a bit confusing to you, just know that the first number will always be the sum and the second one, the number of nodes. You can put them in any order, but this is how I'm gonna choose to do it. Okay, so back at node 420, we've processed everything beneath it, a whole lot of nothing. Now we can finally apply our logic, just like before. We have a total sum of 420 plus zero plus zero divided by one, which is this node right here, plus zero nodes from the left subtree and the zero nodes from the right subtree. This gets us 420. That equals node 420, good job. We can increment a count variable, C for count, from zero to one. On the backtrack, we know what to do. We return our total sum of 420 of the left subtree and the number of nodes of one. At node 10, we don't process it just yet. We have to explore its other child, node 27. It's only when we process everything beneath it that we can finally process node 10. That's the rule of post order and it works pretty neatly for this problem. We're at node 27, I'll cut to the chase. For obvious reasons, we get a match. 27 plus zero plus zero over one plus zero plus zero is 27. We'll increment our count to two. On the backtrack, we return two things, the sum of 27 and the number of nodes one to capture this one. Back in node 10, we'll apply our logic. What's the sum of our entire left subtree? It's the 420 denoted right here. What about the right? is the 27 plus the current node of 10. We want to include it for our average calculation divided by the number of nodes in the left subtree, which is just one, one in the right subtree and one for the node itself, node 10. 
This comes out to be 152, which does not equal our node of 10. We do not increment our account, and from there we backtrack out of our original stack frame, technically returning 457 and 3 nodes. But we don't do anything with it. We return a count of 2. That's our answer. Nice. All right, let's code this up. Okay, so here's our main function signature average of subtree. We're given a root node with which we'll call a helper function, perhaps called post order. And then after that, we'll magically return a count variable to return as our answer. Of course, back to reality, we don't have either of these things. Let's instantiate them. That in the solution constructor, we'll initialize a count variable called count zero initialized. The other thing we'll need is a recursive function and it takes in a node. We'll first implement this by writing a single base case that we observed that if the current node that we ever recurs to is null, we'll return a sum of zero as well as zero nodes. After, we'll explore all the nodes beneath it before we process the current node. We'll call our DFS function with the left subtree as well as the right subtree. Now we can expect two things back. That from the left subtree, we get the left sum as well as the left nodes in that order. This is how I chose to do it. Similarly, we'll get the right sum in the right nodes from the right subtree. On the backtrack from these two children, we'll apply the bulk of our mathematics. What's the current sum that we have? That's the combination of the left sum plus the right sum and the current nodes value. How many nodes do we have in total? Likewise, that's the left nodes plus right nodes plus one to capture the current node. We find the average by doing sum over the number of nodes and seeing if it ever equals the current nodes value. And if it does, we'll increment our count variable. When that's all said and done, we'll return two things, the sum that we extended as well as the number of nodes, which we incremented. And that is it. Great work. There does exist a variant that may make you think more than you expect. Let's dive into it. We're still given the root of a binary tree, but we now have to return a boolean of whether the value of every node is equal to the average of the values in its subtree. So in example one, we return one big fat false because not every node equals its subtree average. It's all because of this node eight. At first glance, it seems like a trivial twist. And to some, maybe it is. Either way, let's do some discovery work with an example. From what we learned from the original Leco problem, you're probably thinking that I'm a dummy and that we could reuse literally the same implementation as before for this variant. In other words, we let the algorithm run its course and eventually get back two things that we expect, the sum and the number of nodes. I will say the number of nodes here would be very important. In this very contrived tree, let's just say there are, I don't know, 3000 nodes. As another thing throughout this, we kept track of another variable. And it was the count, right? The count of nodes that equal its subtree average. If our count here that we get back is ever exactly 3000, so it equals the number of total nodes, then that means our entire tree is a tree in which each node equals its subtree average. Thus, we can compare these two numbers, and if they are the same, we return true. However, your interviewer may not like this very much. What if, for example, you recurse, recurse, and recurse like you normally would with post order, and then shortly on the backtrack, you see that this node does not equal its subtree average. Seven divided by two is not six. This means we discovered an invalid node, and ideally we just backtrack back to the root and then be done. Why check the rest of our tree when we don't have to? However, as per our existing logic, we'd still go down our right subtree, down the other 2,900 and something something nodes. That's not very efficient, and although our time complexity would still be big O of n, it's just technically slower. We'd be processing 3,000 nodes when we could have just processed the four or so. Therefore, this is what I propose. The moment you discover a single node that is not equal the average of its subtree, we can return back some sort of flag. 
some flag to tell the upstream nodes that, hey, we found an invalid node. We'd like to short circuit our DFS and return all the way back to the original stack frame where we can stop our function and save a lot of time. My only question is what should these flags be exactly? Well, recall back when I mentioned that we can only be given positive node values, never negative ones. Why not take advantage of this and from node six, return a sum of say negative one and a count of negative one. Granted, this could be anything that's negative, negative 9,000, whatever, but I'm just gonna use negative one. It's a lot faster to write out. And on the backtrack to this node, we can have an if statement that if we see a bunch of negative ones, that means we want to disconnect early from our algorithm. Let's continue to return negative one, negative one for the upstream stack frame, where on the root node, we'll do the same thing. We'll return negative one, negative one, and choose not to go down the other subtree. Back in the main function, the caller that dispatched this whole DFS in the first place, will note that if we see a negative one at all, we'll return false. And for the opposite case, if we do not see negative ones, we'll return true as normal. That would mean that every node was valid and equal the average. Overall, our time complexity, yes, would be big O n, and our space complexity would also be big O n because of stack frame reasons. Please note that in the variance logic, I didn't mention the count variable at all. And that's because we don't really need it. We can get rid of it, and that simplifies our algorithm ever so slightly. Okay, this was a whole lot of ideas. Let's put it all together in one quick walkthrough. Here is our example tree. There are 10,000 nodes. I hope you have an hour to spare. But just kidding, we were actually high IQ for this problem. We start our DFS from the root node going to the left, landing us at node 8. We keep recursing to node 1, and then to its left child of null. For our base case, remember, we return a sum of 0, count of 0, and we do the same exact thing for the right child, zero, zero. Now doing some math, our overall sum of one divided by one is one. For all we know, we have a valid tree so far. We return for the backtrack, a sum of one in a count of one to node eight. We go to its right subtree and get back zero, zero. Does node eight equal its subtree average? Eight plus one divided by two is four, which is not eight. Thus, we can debut our new return logic that on the backtrack, we'll spit out our negative one, negative one flags. At node five, we do not choose to go down the right subtree because an if statement catches the negatives, which will continue to return for the original function, where finally we'll inspect these two integers. We can look at one, both, whatever floats your boat, see that is full of negatives and return false. That's our answer, that's what we return. And just so you know, in the code, I'll randomly decide to look at the second integer, which I will have named result. Okay, let's modify our existing logic to accommodate for these changes. Okay, first things first, check out our new function signature. It's now named differently, is subtree average. Make sense? Now, unlike before, we actually wanna do something with our return type from the DFS function. We can once again expect two things, the sum, which we won't use, and the number of nodes, which we called result. To remind you, we can look at either flag, but I'm gonna to choose to arbitrarily look at the number of nodes. That, if it doesn't equal negative one, will return true, and otherwise false. Another thing we must note in the variance is that we no longer need the count variable. So let's delete our entire constructor and anywhere else that it's referenced, specifically line 11. Okay, for the last part, Let's go through our post order function and modify everything as appropriate. Our base case remains exactly the same, untouched, and so does the actual tree traversal algorithm, as well as most of our quick math. Now, when we actually have the average calculation, we're now only concerned with the case where we have an invalid node where its value does not equal the subtree average. That will tell us whether or not to short circuit our entire DFS. To accomplish this, we'll return our two flags, negative one, negative one. And then on the backtrack, we'll have to write an if statement to look at these two flags. That if we get a negative one from left nodes or from the right subtree, we'll continue passing upstream the negative one, negative one. And there you have it. And if you learned something today, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you.